I've had several people request me to do a Whatever Happened to the Band episode on the group Cracker. They were best known for their early 90s hits Low and Teen Angst, and today, let's take a look at the history of the band. The beginning of Cracker started with co-founder David Lowry, who grew up in Redlands, California, the part of the state that was a site of the S festivals, rock parties, and shows of the Swing Auditorium. Lowry began his musical career at the age of 16 when he started playing experimental music on his guitar. His early efforts would be featured in one underground magazine. From there, he soon started playing in bands named Box of Laughs and Estonian Gauchos, who covered new wave music. Box of Laughs would feature future Cracker member and co-founder Johnny Hickman. The band would lay the groundwork for what was to come next with Hickman telling Rolling Stone, there were no rules, we could play any style of music we wanted, so we played everything from European folk music to ska to country to hardcore punk to reggae. Soon enough, Lowry would form the eclectic band Camper Van Beethoven, and Hickman for his part would turn down multiple offers to join the group due to his other musical projects at the time. A musical salad of ska, polka, folk, 60s psychedelic rock with flavors of Middle Eastern music, the band would put out several albums for Virgin Records. Camper Van Beethoven soon developed a cult following with the college crowd thanks to their 1985 hit Take the Skinheads Bowling. Now residing in Santa Cruz, California, the musicians had lots of time to kill, which helped them develop their musical sound, with Lowry telling Rolling Stone, we didn't really have anything else to do in a town like Santa Cruz. Also, it was so easy to do this kind of weirdo music that was a reaction to all the straight-laced punk stuff that was around then. The band even got some notoriety being featured on MTV's alternative rock program 120 Minutes, and Michael Stipe of R.E.M. included the band's 1985 debut record, Telephone Free Landslide Victory, in his top 10 albums of the year in Rolling Stone. The band even ended up opening for both R.E.M. and 10,000 Maniacs, and they could have reached the same level of superstardom, but in 1989, the wheels came off while on the road in Europe. Musical disagreements between Lowry and the rest of the band made him the odd man out, and he would tell Rolling Stone, I sort of had a big brother attitude with them. I was always like, you stupid kids, you're blowing it. Can't you see it? So I went, okay, go and do your thing, but after six months, I just got tired of waiting around. It was following the disillusion of the band that Lowry would move to Richmond, California to live with his girlfriend. It was here he contacted his old friend Hickman, who had been playing in a variety of country bands in and around Bakersfield. Lowry and Hickman would rent a cheap apartment in a rough neighborhood of Richmond where they came up with 20 songs. These would form the basis of the demo that they sent to Lowry's label Virgin, who still had the musician under contract. And that's how the band Cracker would be born. Cracker's music would be much more straightforward rock and roll than Camper Van Beethoven. In fact, it would be Lowry's hidden musical taste that really served as the inspiration for his new project telling the LA Times. For years, I was in this semi-famous alternative rock band and people would go, what are your influences? So I'd usually start at about the punk rock era and edit out a lot of things. You don't tell people. Secretly, I listened to the first four Tom Petty records over and over again. You don't tell people that ZZ Top's Trey Hombres is a great record. I remember talking about Led Zeppelin a few times in the earlier camper days and the reaction was always, God, you like this horrible 70s bombastic thing? Cracker would be led by Lowry and Hickman with a revolving cast of musicians throughout their career. Lowry would tell the Washington Post why this was the case, recalling, Really the band is me and singer-guitarist Johnny Hickman, and we've always made that very clear. We did that on purpose. After Camper Van Beethoven, I didn't want to be in a full band where everyone has an equal vote, because basically nothing got done. I'm not sure that compromise and democracy are really good for a band. Bands I know that are like that spend most of their time on interpersonal stuff. Lowry would tell the Baltimore Sun where the name Cracker came from, saying, I was born in Texas. I've got family from Arkansas. I probably know all the different ins and outs of that word as well as anyone. Well, Cracker is really just a harsher version of like white trash. To me, it's almost more comical in a way. Like some of my family from Arkansas with their friends and stuff, it's always Cracker this and Cracker that. They call each other Peckerwood too, it's the same thing. Now of course, there would be some people who accuse the band of being racist based solely on their name, something they shot back against. The name would also have another inspiration with Lowry revealing that it was during their time in San Francisco Dance-oriented rock was hugely popular, and compared to acts who played that style of music, himself and Hickman played what they referred to as Cracker Soul. 
The band would release their debut album, which was self-titled in 1992. And while it wouldn't chart in America, it would produce the band's first big hit, Teen Angst, which topped the modern rock charts. The album would go on to sell nearly 200,000 copies, which was more than double of Camper Van Beethoven's most popular record. The band would soon be labeled as alternative rock and lumped in with bands coming out of Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. But Larry, for his part, didn't appreciate the term telling the LA Times, I never really had a great affinity actually for the alternative underground music scene. If you remember Camper's first record was making fun of cool underground fashion trends and music and stuff like that. I mean, that music tends to be what I listen to, but I'm not really stuck in one scene and never have been. I find that a lot of alternative music isn't really that alternative, it's just that the bands happen to be English or on a certain record label, I try to find good music wherever I hear it. He would, however, credit the bands from the Pacific Northwest with helping Cracker commercially, telling the Orlando Sentinel, I think what Nirvana and Pearl Jam did was shake radio up a bit. The station started playing less old men's music, and that's helped us a lot. Cracker would return in 1993 with their sophomore record and their commercial breakthrough, Kerosene Hat. The record would go platinum and would be the band's highest charting record of their career, peaking at number 59 on the album charts in America. And the promotion cycle for the album would see the band tour alongside the Counting Crows, who would have a much quicker rise to stardom than Cracker did. But the band didn't mind their slow and steady rise, owing much of their success to word of mouth and constant touring. Kerosene Hat would owe much of its success to the single Low. That would be born out of a sound check with Hickman telling Spin Magazine. We were sound checking in Portland, all a little bit hungover, and I was just making noise. I started looping that riff over and over, and David and Davey got up and started playing it too. We kept playing until we had four chords, and David asked the front of the house guy to record it. I probably would have forgotten that riff if it had not been recorded. The song would end up peaking at number 3 on the modern rock charts and number 64 on the pop charts. The music video, which was shot in black and white, was mostly memorable because of Lowry's boxing match with actress and comedian Sandra Bernhard. Lowry would tell the Buffalo News, I didn't want it to look like a blind melon video. I'm a different person than those people. I grew up in a different era, in a different place. To me, the video represents the song really well. It's a song about an obsession with a woman, comparing it to an addiction. The idea to feature the comedian and actress would come from the director of the video, who interviewed Lowry ahead of the shoot, with him recalling to spin. Carlos Grasso, the director, is half Italian and half Mexican, and he just can't help getting really abstract and theoretical. He interviewed me about Low and finally decided it was a battle between my masculine and feminine side. He asked who would be my feminine other, and I said, I don't know, Sandra Bernard? Someone really sarcastic, snarky, gangly. He's like, great, we'll call her up and see if she wants to box you. Initially, Bernhard said she would only do the shoot if she liked the song, and she ended up loving it and agreed to do it. But the song also landed the band in some hot water. Due to the numerous drug references, the head of the band's label would force Lowry to write a letter to radio stations denying that the song had anything to do with drugs. With the frontman recalling to spin, Michael Plen, the label's head of rock radio and a longtime camper and cracker supporter, made me write a letter about that to pass out to radio stations. It was practically an affidavit swearing that the phrase was actually being stoned, not stoned. 1994 would see Cracker tour with both the Gin Blossoms and Spin Doctors, two bands I've previously covered as part of my Whatever Happened To series, the links are down below. Someone claimed that Lowry had sold out his indie roots, but he would respond back to critics telling Rolling Stone, anybody who tells you, oh yeah, we only like to play clubs, we like this intimate atmosphere, has not played in front of 10,000 people who just totally dig your sh**. That's just such a rush, man, that's a blast. Cracker would return in 1996 with their third album, The Golden Age. The album would be delayed after the band's bassist injured his finger while sharpening a knife. The album took the band in a different direction, focusing more on ballads and space rock, and proved to be a much more introspective record. Hickman would tell Rolling Stone at the time, I don't like one-dimensional albums, I like albums where I feel like I've been someplace when I get to the end of it. The album would peak at number 63, making it the band's second highest charting record. Although the label told Billboard magazine they felt confident that the album would go multi-platinum, it didn't. The band's follow-up 1998's Gentleman Blues would put a greater emphasis on growing up, with Lowry telling the LA Times, This record is where we're really conscious that we're not going to be young anymore. This record is a lot more about our age. That led to the band not appealing to a younger college crowd, adding in the same interview, 
Our audience is definitely adult and I'm really comfortable with that. As some bands get older, they're so desperate to have a young hip crowd like them, it gets sort of sad. The record would prove to be Cracker's last charting album for nearly a decade, peaking at number 182. But despite their fading commercial performance, the band was still a solid live draw. The band would owe much of their longevity and relevance to profitable tours with Lowry telling the LA Times, we can play a show at any time, whether we have a record out or not, whether we have a song on the radio or not, and people will come out. I feel like we're somebody's favorite band, and a lot of bands can't say that. Cracker would release what would be their final album for Virgin in 2002 with Forever. It would be their first release in 10 years to not chart, and the band soon left the label, and soon signed with BMG for 2003's mostly western and country covers album Countrysides. The parting with Virgin wasn't amicable though, with Hickman revealing to the Deseret News, the record company at the time had no idea how to market us, and last year they were putting all their efforts into signing Mariah Carey, and basically left us hanging while we were touring. Two years later, an annual concert festival known as Camp Out in Pioneer Town, California, which featured numerous bands including Camper Van Beethoven and Cracker, would be started. The band would release two more albums for the rest of the decade with their 2009 effort, Sunrise in the Land of Milk and Honey, being their first album in nearly a decade to chart, peaking at number 172. The album was helped by the inclusion of the lead single, being featured on the program Californication. The band will put out their last record in 2014 titled Berkeley to Bakersfield. Lowry, for his part, has been a vocal critic of streaming services and how little they paid artists. He would make headlines in 2013 when he published how much he received in royalties after having the song Low played on Spotify a million times. Lowry said Pandora paid him a whopping $16.89 for more than a million streams of the song during the last three months of 2012. Since he owned 40% of the song, Pandora shelled out $42.23 to all the songwriters. Lowry claimed he made more money off a single concert t-shirt than he did off the song thanks to Pandora. Lowry would also publish how much he got paid from terrestrial and satellite radio streams of the song, revealing 9,000 plays of low on US terrestrial radio earned him $1,400, while Sirius XM, paid him $182 for spinning the song nearly 180 times. It was a few years later that Lowry filed a $200 million lawsuit against Spotify, claiming that the company knowingly distributed copyrighted songs without paying for the mechanical licenses. Soon enough, other songwriters piled in against the company and a class action lawsuit was filed against Spotify. The streaming giant would end up reaching a settlement with the songwriters, which resulted in them paying out tens of millions of dollars to publishers and songwriters who hadn't previously been earning money by Spotify streaming their material. Cracker to this day is still active on the touring circuit, playing shows as recently as last year, and they have scheduled dates planned in 2023. Outside of Cracker, Lowry has reunited with Camper Van Beethoven, He's also become a producer, most notably working with Accounting Crows and Joan Osborne, and has even worked on a solo career and acted in several independent films. Lowry would look back at his career with one regret telling the LA Times, I wish I got the same kind of press that say a Paul Westerberg got, while also admitting at the same time, and I quote, it has also kept me hungry and it's made me better at what I do. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again in Rock Country Stories. Take care.